our third speaker in this session, uh, Siddharth Shuresh, who is a um, research assistant in Dr. Uh, Emily Ward's laboratory at uh, University of Wisconsin uh, Madison. Sid, would you like to take it away? Yeah. Hello guys, uh, I'm Siddharth Suresh and I work as a research assistant advised by Dr. Emily Ward at the Visual Cognition Lab in the University of Wisconsin-Madison. This is my very first academic talk and I'm excited to present my project to all of you. In this talk, I'm going to talk about the emergence of visual ensemble representations in deep neural networks. With Halloween coming up, I'm really excited to start seeing candies all around. Besides from knowing that these are Halloween candies, these are very interesting visual stimuli for a couple of reasons. Just by looking at these images, there's a few types of visual information that we can recognize. We can perceive what the average shape is. The starbursts on the left have a square shape and the assorted mixture of candies on the right are roughly bean shaped. We can also recognize the average color of these images. The average color is not explicitly present in the images, but we have the ability to compute it. Surprisingly, we can also recognize the color diversity. That is, if the colors come from a diverse set or not. All of these properties, the average shape, the average color, and the, av and the color diversity are examples of different types of ensemble perception. Ensemble perception refers to the visual system's ability to extract summary statistical information from groups of similar objects, often in a brief glance. Today, I'm going to be focusing on color diversity. It has been found that people perceive color diversity without actively paying attention and without perceiving the individual elements that make up the image. All of what I've told you suggests that humans automatically and efficiently extract ensemble properties. Such ensembles are thought to be a solution to the capacity limitations of the human visual system. At the surface level, this has a lot of similarity with object recognition which is something we also seem to do somewhat automatically and very efficiently. But object recognition differs from ensemble perception in a couple of different ways. In a lot of cases, colors are often arbitrary and not very meaningful while recognizing objects. Hence, when it comes to object recognition, we may not want to retain the color information. It may be helpful to generalize over color and use other features instead. The primary question that I am going to be answering today is, do ensemble representations arise in a visual system that only recognizes objects? Given that colors can be arbitrary, they may not be encoded in representations when you're only doing the task of recognizing objects. Apart from object recognition, humans do a lot of different tasks, but we now have artificial visual systems that are good at only recognizing objects. And I'm going to be using these systems for our experiment. Deep neural networks are known to be modeled after primate vision. The information in deep neural networks is coded hierarchically as we move from shallower layers to deeper layers. Shallow layers and deep layers are the layers that are closer to the input and the output respectively. The represent representations within these layers become more sophisticated as we go deeper into the network. We can extract these intermediate layer representations which make deep neural networks good tools for studying the visual representations underlying various perceptual tasks in a visual system. These representations comprise of different number of units depending on the layer which they correspond to. In our experiments, we use the ResNet 50 deep neural network, which is trained to recognize objects. This network takes an image as its input and predicts the objects that are present in the input image at the output. The network is trained using 14 million images to recognize objects belonging to 1000 different classes. We refer to this as a pre-trained network. In the slide, an image of a boat is presented to the deep neural network and the network extracts features from the image. The features turn into more sophistication representations as they move deeper into, as they move deeper into the network. The network uses the representations from the pre-final layer to identify the presence of the boat. Kindly note that the illustration in the slide is used to explain how the deep neural network in our experiment works and does not accurately depict the architecture of ResNet 50. Now that we have the deep neural network that we will be using, I am going to answer two questions. We'll first find out if color is represented in these networks, and then we'll see if the ensemble property of color diversity is represented in the network. First, I will be focusing on color representations. To answer this question, we choose images that represent everyday objects. 
These images were designed to make sure that the objects could be of any color and were not associated to a specific color. We use a stimulus set containing 540 unique objects, each being red, green, and blue in color. These stimuli were presented as an input to our pre trained neural network, and we extracted intermediate layer representations starting from the shallow layers. Each of these intermediate layer representations comprises of neural like units, which were used as an input to a linear classifier. The linear classifier was trained to identify the color of the object present in the image. This process was repeated for the deeper layers. The linear classifier was trained on different number of randomly sampled units for all the intermediate layer representations used in our experiment. We varied the number of randomly sampled units to see how the color information was distributed among the units in a layer. We also wanted to see how the performance varied as we increased the number of randomly sampled units. We randomly sampled 500, 200, 100, 50, 20, and 10 units in our experiment. The X axis in the graph refers to the names of the different intermediate layers used in our experiment. As we move from left to right on the X axis, the layers become deeper. This means that con three is farthest from the output followed by con two and the pre final layer is the closest to the output. The chance level accuracy of this task was around 33% and the classifier was able to perform better than chance regardless of the layer and the number of units. All the points are statistically above chance except for the most sparsely sampled point in the pre-final layer. All the slopes are also significant with a p-value of less than 0.01. Hence, we can say that color information is present in shallow, intermediate, and deep layers of the network. It decreases in deeper layers and reduces with more sparse representation. What about object categories? Are they still distinct? To assess this, we used TSNI to visualize how layer representation vectors cluster. TSNI is a dimensionality reduction technique that is often used to visualize high dimensional vectors in two dimensions. If color information is dominant, we would expect to see clusters that are roughly organized based on color. And if the object information is dominant, we would expect to see tiny clusters, each comprising, each corresponding to object categories. In the earliest layer, we see a little bit of object clustering, but primarily the organization is by color. In the next layer, the organization of the clusters changes to being organized much more by objects. And in the pre-final layer, clusters are very clearly organized by object category. What this shows is that object categories are still being preserved, which is after all the goal of the network. It also shows that color information, though classifiable, gets more suppressed compared to object information in deeper layers. So firstly, I pose the question of if the color is represented in the network and we see that color is represented at all layers of the network. We also see that object categories are preserved. Now we go on to see if ensemble properties are represented in the network. I started off by introducing you to this idea of color diversity using Halloween candy. Clearly, we are not using these images for the experiment. The type of stimuli that I'm going to use are a little is a little simpler and they look like this. This is a simple way of presenting color diversity that has previously been used on human subjects. The colors of the letters in the stimuli were sampled from the color wheels shown depending on its diversity. For low diversity images, four, four colors were sampled from six adjacent colors on the color wheel. And for high diversity images, four colors were sampled from the 19 colors present on the color wheel. The stimulus set consisted of 12,600 images, half of which were low diversity images and the rest for high diversity images. We used the same approach as earlier. And since we are still interested in knowing how the color diversity information is distributed within units, we use the same sampling approach as well. The chance level accuracy of this task was 50% and the classifier was able to perform way better than chance regardless of the number of units and the layers again. All the points were statistically significant and all the slopes were also significant with a p-value of less than 0.01. Hence, we can say that color diversity is present in shallow, intermediate, and deep layers of the network. We can also say that it decreases in deeper layers and that it reduces with more sparse representation. We use this type of stimuli since it has been used before with people, but low and high is a pretty rough measure of color diversity. 
in all these cases, we can actually get a measure of col color diversity by calculating the average variance of each image. The average image, average variance is calculated as the average of the variance of all the non-zero pixels present in each of the color channels that make up the image. Getting a person to tell you these numbers is pretty difficult, but getting a network to predict these continuous values is a lot easier. And we'll use regression now to see how well the regression fits the continuous value of color diversity. Here, the only thing that we changed is from, from earlier is that we now use linear regression to predict the continuous value of average variance. What now is what's now important is to see how these networks model variance. I would now be plotting the R squared. We find that the 500 randomly sampled units account for about 75% of the average variance in color diversity. The R squared value increases as we increase the number of sample units. There is no clear trend about how the average variance fit changes across the layers for the same number of sample units. So are colored ensemble properties represented in the network? Yes, color ensembles are represented in all layers of the network and they account for quite a bit of variance while predicting color diversity. I would like to conclude by saying that deep neural networks trained for just object recognition are sensitive to color diversity, indicating the presence of ensemble representations. Even though color may not be meaningful to recognize an object, deep neural networks retain the information of color and the relationship between these colors. Unlike humans, deep neural networks have no computational capacity constraints, and yet we find the presence of ensemble properties in them. Deep neural networks can be useful in studying the neural mechanisms of ensemble perception. Thank you guys for listening to this talk, and I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Emily Ward. Thank you, thank you, Sid. Awesome talk. Uh, we already have a couple of uh, couple of questions for you. Um, so I am going to try to go in order of popularity. Um, the first one being. Is there a database here since uh, although there is 50% low and high diversity image split, the combinatorial complexity of the high diversity images should be much higher, requiring more training images? Uh, I'm sorry, I lost you in the middle there. Could you please? Uh, Do you have the, can you open your, uh, the Q&A? Uh, yes, I just opened the it. Bottom? Right, so this is the... Uh, is there a data? Now. Okay. Right. Uh, it's the question from Cole Hurwitz. Is there a data bias here? Since although there are there is a 50% low and high di uh, diversity image split, the combinatorial complexity of the high diversity images should be much higher and hence requiring more training images. Uh this is a very good question. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to say that uh, the network that we used was pre-trained on ImageNet and it wasn't used, and used uh, like we didn't use these and our images, our stimuli to train this network. And secondly, uh, we based this off of a paper by Bronfman where they, and Dr. Ward uh, who evaluate the same stimuli on stimuli on humans, uh, but maybe I can. We will go back and look at this further. Thank you, and I think we have time for uh, one more question. Um, you mentioned that no clear pattern emerged for color diversity across layers, but for nearly all samples, it looked better at cone four. Perhaps this is showing an intermediate level optimization. This is the top question right now. Uh, yes, so, but uh, we did see that, I mean, the trend was visible, but then for the least number of, for like sparse sampling, we don't see this trend, which is why uh, uh, since uh, the project is still in works, we'd like to go investigate this in more detail. Great. Um, I think we have 
time for maybe one more question. Uh, I think this is a short one. Have you tested this neural network's performance on black and white images? Uh, I have not tested the neural network's performance, uh, but I'm pretty sure there's a lot of literature which uh, uh, checks how these uh, new how the Resident 50 performs the on Resident 50, which is pre-trained on ImageNet, performs on black and white images. All right, great. Uh, thank you very much. I think we will uh, we will stop here. Uh, in the interest of 